Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you're hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, October 18th, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for October 18th, 2021. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Buell? Here. Council Members Cavanaugh? Here. Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. City Attorney Bromwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Buell, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much, Adrian. At this time, I would ask all who are able to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda are proclamations, and we are going to shift around the order and do Gentleman Day first. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Lights on after sorry, school. lights on after school day first. I apologize. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, is there someone in the chambers? Oh, yes, I see her to uh, accept this proclamation. <laughs> Good evening. Would you like to say anything before? Good evening, friends. It's, I'm Beth McGorry, and I'm the Director of Donor Relations at St. Mark Youth Enrichment. And we're so honored to be back in person with you. And this celebration of lights on after school is so much more needed than it has ever been in previous years. Um, we know in this room that after school programs aren't guaranteed um, in our community. There's so many reasons why. And um, St. Mark has been around since 1988, giving kids a safe space after school, but giving moms and dads a feeling of comfort and employers an opportunity to know that their moms and dads are going to stay at work until 5.30 every day. And they're going to feel comfortable and be great employees. And the best part about being at St. Mark is that we get to build really beautiful, amazing children, little humans that are just fabulous. Today I had a kindergartner, after reading her Amanda Gorman's book, decided to take that book on change and retell the story and be a teacher and want to teach the class her new story of how to make change in our community. And that's what we're about. That's why this celebration of Light Sun After School is so important. So thank you for your continued um, support within our community, and we're so very thankful. Thank you very much uh, for those words, Beth, and good to see you again in person at one of these meetings, so uh, that's an extra bonus. Thank you for being here for, to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas during the COVID-19 pandemic, after school programs have risen to the moment to support youth and are critical supports to help youth recover from this challenging time and address their academic, social, and emotional needs. During the pandemic, programs innovated to promote or 
to provide, excuse me, uh, remote learning support, virtual programming, care for children of essential workers, meal support, wellness check-ins, and more. And whereas St. Mark Youth Enrichment has provided significant leadership in the area of community involvement in the education and well-being of our youth, grounded in the principles that quality after-school programs are key to children becoming successful adults. And whereas Lights On After School, the national celebration of after-school programs held this year on October 28th, promotes the importance of quality after-school programs in the lives of children, families, and communities. And whereas more than 28 million children in the U.S. have parents who work outside the home, and 15.1 million children have no place to go after school, and whereas many after-school programs across the country are facing funding shortfalls so severe, they are being forced to close their doors and turn off their lights. And whereas the city of Dubuque is committed to investing in the health and safety of all young people by providing expanded learning opportunities that will help close the achievement gap and prepare young people to compete in the global economy. Now, therefore, I, Roy D. Buell, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, to hereby proclaim the 28th of October, 2021, as Lights On After School Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and hereby enthusiastically endorse Lights On After School and commit our community to engage in innovative after-school programs and activities that ensure the lights stay on and the doors stay open for all children after school. <coughs> Okay, and our next uh, proclamation is Boards and Commission Recognition Day. And I believe, Adrian, you're going to accept this proclamation. Yes, thank you. Adrian Breitfelder, City Clerk. The purpose of uh, Boards and Commissions Recognition Day is to sit, uh, extend a thank you to all of our Boards and Commissions volunteers for their service within the city. City of Dubuque Boards and Commissions are um, volunteer-based opportunities in which residents work around a specific um, topic or issue um, and promote that within the city. Uh, we typically uh, recognize our Boards and Commissions volunteers with an annual picnic that takes place each July. And unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been unable to host the picnic the past two years. So we wanted to make sure we still found a way to let our boards and commissioners know how much we appreciate the personal time and energy and passion they put into our boards and commissions. Uh, so we appreciate the mayor reading this proclamation. Um, we have uh, purchased a Dubuque-themed gift from Travel Dubuque for each of our boards and commissioners, and they'll be provided a copy of the proclamation with that gift. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adrian, for accepting this uh, proclamation. And thank you to all of our boards and commission members. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas City of Dubuque boards and commissions play an important role in city government by serving as the voice of residents, assisting in the development of policy recommendations, providing support to city staff, and promoting the city's programs. And whereas boards and commissions are volunteer-based opportunities, meaning residents dedicate their personal time and energy to make a difference in the community. And whereas boards and commissions are greatly appreciated by the city council and city staff for their service to the city of Dubuque. And whereas the challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic have not deterred boards and commissioners uh, from their service and illustrates the flexibility and resiliency of these dedicated volunteers. And whereas service on a board or commission is an excellent way for residents to be civically engaged and contribute to the quality of life in Dubuque. And whereas all City of Dubuque residents are encouraged to consider volunteering on a board or commission as the city actively seeks applicants with diverse backgrounds, life experiences, and perspectives. Now, therefore, I, Roy D. Buell, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 18th of October, 2021, as Boards and Commissioners Commissions Recognition Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and thank all of our boards and commissioners for their dedication to the City of Dubuque. Okay, and our next uh, proclamation is uh, Gentleman Day. Hello, I'm 
Bethany Jacoby. I'm one of our Dubuque advocates um, for Waypoint Services. We would like to say thank you to the city of Dubuque for their <coughs> ongoing support, um, not only to Waypoint, but also our domestic violence program. Um, for those of you who don't know, Waypoint serves seven counties in Northeast Iowa. And in the last year, we were able to help over 2,000 survivors of domestic violence um, through medical advocacy, legal advocacy, um, providing them with resources, um, safety planning, as well as that ongoing support that they might need. Um, so domestic violence is a, obviously a community-wide issue, and we need everybody to stand up and help to fight against domestic violence. So thank you. And well, thank you, Bethany, for being here this evening, and, and for you and all of your, your uh, workers that are working on the same uh, projects uh, for all that they do around domestic violence and eliminating it. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas one in three women will experience domestic violence during her lifetime, and whereas intimate partner violence impacts victims, children, family, friends, and the community at large, and whereas domestic violence is not confined to any group or groups of people, but is experienced in all economic, racial, ethnic, educational, societal, and religious groups, and is sustained by societal indifference. And whereas perpetrators of domestic violence should be held accountable for their actions, and victims should have access to support and services to help them overcome their experience. And whereas it is important to recognize the compassion and dedication of the individuals who provide support to victims of intimate partner violence and work to increase public understanding of this significant problem. And whereas only a coordinated effort from all community members will put a stop to this heinous crime. Now therefore I, Roy D. Buell, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, you hereby proclaim the 19th of October, 2021, as Gentleman Day in the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge everyone to work together to eliminate domestic violence from our community. Okay, and our final proclamation uh, this evening is Trick or Treat Night. And I'm going to accept this one because I love <laughs> Trick or Treat. <laughs> City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas corn stalks, Indian corn, pumpkins, and a golden moon will herald the cool weather of autumn and the entertaining holiday of Halloween. And whereas Halloween is the fun time of year when young and old become creative and emerge as ghosts, devils, witches, cartoon characters, caped crusaders, and action heroes. And whereas all manner of delightful costumed individuals go from house to house on their annual pilgrimage for candy and treats, announcing their arrival with a hearty trick or treat. Now therefore I, Roy D. Buell, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim Sunday, October 31st, 2021, as trick-or-treat night during the hours of 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge all motorists to be watchful of our youngsters making their annual rounds. Okay, Adrian. We'll move on to consent items. At this time, Anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through five of the agenda. Hey, thank you, Adrian. Uh, is there anyone in the chambers who would like anything on that consent agenda held for separate discussion? Seeing no one, do we have any uh, virtual requests? There in. are no comments in the GoToMeeting chat, and I have unmuted our phone participants, so they may speak as well. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, the city clerk has not received any emails regarding the consent items. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, then I'll bring the uh, item back to the table. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. <clears throat> Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. We'll move on to items set for public hearing, and we have two. First is second amendment to lease agreement between the City of Dubuque and Iowa Greyhound Association for November 1st, 2021. And second is setting a public hearing at a special city council meeting on November 22nd, 2021 on a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Setzer Properties DBQ LLC providing for the sale of city-owned real estate to Setzer Properties DBQ LLC pursuant to the development agreement for November 22, 2021. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearing for the dates and times specified. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber. Aye. <clears throat> Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Public hearings will be held in the council chambers at the dates and times indicated. We'll move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Civic Center Advisory Commission, Civil Service Commission, Investment Oversight Advisory Commission, and the Transit Advisory Board. Okay, is there anyone in the chambers or virtually that wants to uh, respond to the application of Brenda Christner for the Civic Center Advisory Commission? Okay, uh, is there anyone who would like to uh, <clears throat> respond to the application of Daniel White for the Civil Service Commission? Okay, we'll move on then to the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission and the application of Molly Velasky. Okay, and then we'll move on to the Transit Advisory Board. We've got two positions there, and we have uh, Matthew Esser, Greg Orwall, and Blake Scharf as the uh, applicants. Anyone to address any of those three? Okay, hearing none, Adrian, we'll move on to the public hearings. All right, public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. And public hearing number one is request to amend the Westmark planned unit development. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh. I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Jones. A motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Jones. Uh, Mike, please. Oh, I guess you don't have a lid. No, Wally, please. <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Mayor. You get me instead of Mike. So. <laughs> I was just trying to change it up there for a <laughs> Go ahead, Wally, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Wally Wormott, Planning Services Manager. The request before you tonight is to amend the Westmark Planning Unit Development to allow drive-through pickup windows for pharmacies. Um, this would allow the new Grand River Medical Group building, which is being constructed right now, to have a drive-through pharmacy. And the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing on October 6th. The Westmark PUD was established in 1991 and it encompassed five parcels of lands, land located on the southwest corner of, the, of Northwest Ontario on the Pennsylvania Avenue. Four of those parcels are fully developed with large commercial buildings that are home to tenants, such as the Great River Learning, Kendall Hunt, Westmark Development Corporation, Westside Occupational Health, Unity Point, Health Finley, 
um, hospital, Horizon Management Services, and then that fifth parcel I just mentioned, the Grand River Medical Group is currently building that three-story building. So the current Westmark Plan Unit Development Ordinance allows for medical offices and clinics, but restricts all those operations and activities associated with those uses being conducted within an enclosed building with very few exceptions. And those exceptions that I include for outdoor uses are off-street parking, employee recreational facilities, drive-up bank facilities, outdoor area for group daycare center, and an open-air restaurant seating. And because um, drive through pharmacy is not listed as one of those uses, we have to look at amending the PUD for the Grand River Medical Center Group to have this drive-up pharmacy. As stated, the current PUD was established in 1991, quite a few years ago, which was right about the, around the time when drive through pharmacies were just starting to kind of get off the, off the I guess, off the shelf or to begin with. So, um, you know, at that time, they didn't really consider drive through pharmacies when they were looking at these medical offices, clinics, and buildings. So, since then, they've become quite common in our area and our community. You see a lot of drive through pharmacies. So, um, this subject pharmacy would be operated by a local pharmacy, and it's anticipated that many of those patients that go to this um, Grand River Medical um, Group building for services for the clinics would uh, pick up most of their pharmacy pharmaceutical needs inside the building at that pharmacy, and that the drive through pharmacy would only really be projected for those that may have to get a refill or may be coming from another um, location because it, it will be a local pharmacy that will own it to be able to take advantage of that. So you're wondering, so the building's going up, how can they be building a building when you're coming through here to look at amending the PUD? So the PUD currently allows the Grand River Medical Group to build the building um, right now. That actually went to the Zoning Advisory Commission based on the pre-PUD requirements. The reason why it's coming back before you right now is because of that amendment to the PUD that allowed only the drive-through portion of that property. And during that discussion, when we get a site plan that comes into our office, it goes through our development review team, it goes through our engineering uh, planning, which is our in construction inspections divisions, fire and building. So when that goes through our office, um, we point out certain concerns that may be associated with that development. And one of the concerns that got brought up was traffic. And I understand there's been a lot of input being received in regards to traffic, specifically at the intersection of Embassy West and Pennsylvania Avenue and how this will have an impact on that. So as part of that site plan review for the Grand River Medical Group building, the engineering department required the applicant to provide a traffic analysis to understand the potential traffic impacts of the medical center on the traffic in that immediate area, like I mentioned, which includes that, that intersection of Embassy West Drive, Pennsylvania Drive, and Westmark Drive. In addition, the city engineering completed a traffic count and delay um, study which is basically uh, tracking how long a vehicle may take at a controlled intersection to be able to make a left-hand turn primarily across two lanes of traffic on the Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, based on those traffic studies, trip generation, traffic counts, and delay studies, the city engineering department has identified that no improvements are currently necessary due to this new development or the drive-through pharmacy at that location. So by a vote of four to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends that the City Council approve the amendment to the plan unit development. A simple majority vote is all that's needed for the City Council to approve this PUD amendment. And we have Acting Chairperson Terry Zaccaro um, is available to answer any questions. She may be participating remotely. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions that you guys may have of me. Okay, thank you, Wally. Uh, anyone have any questions for Wally or for uh, Terry? Okay, thank you very much, Wally. Uh, we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval to amend the Westmark Planned Unit Development, PUD, to allow drive-through pickup windows for pharmacies for the property located at 4025 Westmark Drive. Is there anyone in the chambers to address us on this? Do we have any uh, virtual comments? We do not have any written comments, and I've unmuted our phone participants as well. Thank you. The city clerk has not received any emails regarding this public hearing. Okay, thank you very much. I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Just a quick question. Does this amend the PUD ordinance that this would be an allowable use of any PUD or does this mean that is a specific to this one? 
while they were my planning services manager. So Mr. Jones, planning and developments are very specific ordinances written just for a piece of property. So when we're amending this PUD ordinance, it will only apply to the properties that are identified in the legal description on the ordinance, which would be those five parcels that are part of Westmark. So it's a little bit different than a zoning ordinance where if you amend a district, which is citywide, like a C3 general commercial, that would apply to all C3 general commercial districts. With this area, I should have defined what a PUD is a little bit more. It's very specific written rules just for a certain piece of property to help address negative impacts or mitigate certain things that may have impacts on surrounding properties. It's typically very large scale developments like Asbury Plaza, Port of Dubuque, Historic Millwork District. So to answer your question, it will only apply just to this PUD. Thank so. you. Yep. Okay. And it, Mr. Cavanaugh? Um, I, I do have a, a traffic question after all. Um, the, so you mentioned the, the study, and I know that we, we got that today, so we also have that attached here as a memo, um, and it's very in-depth and I really appreciate it. But I, I think I'd, I would like to hear just a little bit about the safety implications as well, you know, because I think that there is a concern that I've been hearing from, from people who are especially living in Embassy West that there's safety concerns with that intersection, but it appears from the study that those concerns are not necessarily um, represented in the actual, the, the facts of the study itself. Is that true? So based on the information, and I believe the city engineering is here to be able to answer some of those questions. So they take in a lot of analysis when it goes to, involves with that. As that memo that you received that was included part of the packet had a lot of the crash data that was associated with it. Mm -hmm. And based on the number of crashes and the type of uh, crashes, it did not rise to that level that the uh, improvements were needed to be made in, to address some of those concerns. So um, that's a planner trying to explain it to you, but there's engineers that probably do a little bit better job from the traffic engineering side of things, so. I think, I mean, I, I think that basically answers my question along with the yeah. details that we received here. It, it sounds to me like safety is not necessarily um, a concern at this moment based on this development and shouldn't really apply when we when we approve this or, or not at this well, point? Well, I mean, I would, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay, no, go ahead. I would say tra safety is always a concern. Mm -hmm. So there's traffic studies and analysis that get done to help identify certain things. Based on the standards and the practices that have been identified, it doesn't warrant the requirement for a signalized intersection at this location and some other, um, other things that have been identified. So even sometimes we get to the point where uh, signals are put in that actually causes more traffic situations. It also delays traffic from entering a pond and exiting a street. So they're, they have to weigh all those options. And when they did that study and analysis, they looked at that signalized inter inter intersection if that's warranted. Um, and based on that information, it wasn't, so. Thank you, it's very helpful. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thanks again, Walt. Yep. Okay, uh, the motion is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Kavanaugh? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Public hearing number two is request to rezone property at 684 Kane Street. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kavanaugh. I move to, um, actually, <laughs> I move to receive and file and concur with the denial um, from the commission. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Sprank. Uh, Wally, please. Once again, Wally Wormont, Planning Services Manager. Um, the request before you tonight is a rezone, um, an R1 single family residentially zoned property to R3 moderate density multifamily residential to build in order to allow uh, construction of a three unit town home located at 684 um, Kane Street. Should be noted that this property has not been replatted yet. Um, they're going through this process to see if they can get approval for the rezoning before they move forward with the platting of the property. The Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing on October 6th on the request. And at the meeting, the applicant spoke in favor of the request noting that he is proposing to subdivide uh, about a 7,000, a little bit larger 7,000 square foot um, 
lot off from a larger 1.36 acre lot um, in order to facilitate <coughs> that construction of the threeplex. In addition, that threeplex would include the required amount of off street parking, garages, and everything affiliated with it. And based on the zoning requirements of an R3 district, the proposed threeplex would meet all required setbacks, lot area recover, um, coverage, height requirements, off street parking, so it would be compliant based on the zone. However, they would have to go through rezoning in order to accommodate that. Um, staff noted that if it was approved, a site plan would be required and would go through that development review team process that I mentioned with those five departments. Um, at the meeting, there were five neighbors that spoke in opposition to the request, and they were citing concerns about parking, traffic, safety, topography, inadequate space, and the desire to keep the neighborhood as R1 single family residential. Um, the Zoning Advisory Commission discussed the request noting, noting that it would be an R3 zone located in the middle of an R1 single family residential zone. Um, the approval would change the dynamic of the neighborhood and they did not see that there was a mistake in the original rezoning request. By a vote of one to five, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends the City Council deny the request and because the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending denial, that forces a supermajority vote at the City Council level here. So in order to return, overturn the recommendation of denial, the vote would have to be six to one um, in order to approve the rezoning. Um, and then Chairperson Matt Mulligan is available to answer any questions you may have of the commission. Um, that's all I have unless you guys have any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Wally? Okay, thank you very much, Wally. Uh, we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a request from Joe Bean to rezone property located at 684 Kane Street from R1 single family residential to R3 moderate density multifamily residential to build a three unit townhouse. Is there anyone in the chambers to address us on this? Please come to the microphone. And state your name and address and make your comments, please. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name's Rose Taney. I reside at 580 Primrose Court. Um, I actually do have a petition from a lot of the neighbors that are in the surrounding area opposing it as well. So some of our concerns that- you can remove your, your mask if you want to while you're at the podium. Okay. That, if it's easier, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so some of our concerns that we do have and that we did have uh, with the neighbors as well collectively is we do wanna continue to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood as I'm sure you can imagine when you have homes that are really established in a neighborhood like this all of the neighbors really care and there's a sense of community we are concerned that with these duplexes there could be a potential for renting out even though I know that that's not the builders intention here it certainly could happen and that again could mess with the integrity of the neighborhood uh, we do also believe that this may be a situation of spot zoning because looking at the directed map this is actually an R1 neighborhood and we don't see any other R3s in the area. So we did do some review of the spot zoning type uh, situation. It does look like this might be something to be considered for that. We're aware that as soon as this would be approved, spot zoning would no longer be a leg to stand on, so to speak, because once you have one, you have more opportunity for these to continue growing within the neighborhoods as well. Um, so we're also a bit concerned about the increased traffic, potential for noise increase as well. Again, very established neighborhoods, very connected. Um, and also we, we do have a bit of concern about the loss of view that we would have. A lot of the neighbors that have been there for a while, uh, we do have a really nice area there and we're afraid that if we have this ginormous <laughs> building that a lot of the neighbors, especially the ones right beside the lot would actually have total blocking of the view. So um, I do have a petition again with about 26 signatures from the surrounding neighbors. I'm not sure I, who I couldn't present that to, but thank you so much. And uh, that's all. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Thank you. It. Thank you. Anyone else to address this? Good afternoon. My name is Chris Tinney. I live at 580 Primrose Court. I'm just here to state that I oppose the rezoning from R1 to R3 for this property, uh, mainly because uh, you know everything is R1 all around here. Once you do introduce an R3 into this area, 
what's to stop it from continuing, you know, in other parts of the neighborhood. Um, again, we have a lot of people that live in our neighborhood that believe the same way. Um, we really like our peaceful little neighborhood that we have. We just like to continue to keep it that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. My name's uh, Ron Bolt. I uh, live at 668 Kane Street. I've been there for 20 years, and uh, I just can't see changing that from R1 to R3. I'll tell you, I'll give you two good reasons. Number one, it's a great neighborhood. Number two, the city streets that are up there, they do a hell of a job doing them. Now, if you get eight cars parked out on that street and uh, the snowplow's got a hard time going up there now, and if you, uh, if you do that, there's only one place they're gonna park. They're gonna have to park out in the street. Sooner or later, they're gonna have to park in the street. And as far as uh, speed limits up there, I'll tell you, if I was an officer, and I had to get my quota, that'd be the first place I'd sit to get my quota for the day. <laughs> so I, uh, I would like to see you recommend that, you know, you keep it at R1. We got animals in the backyard. Matter of fact, yesterday I had five turkeys in the backyard. They start going up over the top of the hill, who knows what. And my wife just passed away, so she enjoyed it too. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Becky Kraus. I live at 686 Kane Street, which is the property right next to that lot that would be developed. Um, we have lived in that house for 23 years. We knew Earl and Dory Aronson very well. They were very good neighbors of ours. Um, and um, just we really appreciated them as neighbors. We appreciated the empty lot there. We knew one day it would be developed. We expected that, of course. Um, but really, we feel like, I guess one concern I have is how much green space is going to be left after this um, structure goes in, and parking is a problem. I have seen other car accidents with people speeding up and down that street and coming around the curve and stuff. Um, that's a concern that I have. Um, I just really feel like because every other residence around there is a single family residence, it makes sense to keep it as a single family residence. Um, you heard the concerns of some of the other neighbors. I share their concerns. I appreciate a lot of the work that Rose has put into getting the petition and neighbors nearby to um, sign a petition in on this. And so we would respectfully request that you deny the R3 zoning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Good Thank evening. you for letting us speak on this issue. I would take, uh, would take one idea to get an eye, to put this into context is this property is not flat. There is a big range of hills to this area to play with at this point. As doing a feasibility study to, from uh, an R3 to an R1, an R1 family home in this area would be absolutely perfect. It would fill the little space of what they call the broken tooth syndrome. But with this here, you gotta take in consideration the feasibility study what is under the ground. I know there's a sewer system and a drainage system that runs through this area. Whether this is gonna in inhibit this or not, that I do not know at this point. But I would probably uh, let the, the, the members know here that this needs to be have some thought to it before any decision is made. But like I said, as going to an R3, there isn't anything else around except for the Dunn Apartments that are way up by Wallard High School. Another factor is the, the street factor. At seven o'clock in the morning, we have Wallard High School on the other end. It's nonstop traffic for about a good hour. 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, same factor we have. Speed is always an option, but the key of it is if we start throwing eight cars, 10 cars on the street, if we don't have enough parking in the lot, 
Now we go out to the, out to the street, we now have another issue, trying to weave in between these. It's called the Kaufman issue. If you've ever gone up Kaufman Avenue at a rush time of the day, it is a nightmare because of the tight area between everything. And like I said, with cars out in the street, not everybody pays attention to where they're parked or how far are we from the curb. It's one of these issues that we need to take a full look at this, see what happens, and kind of go from there to make our decision. And thank you for letting me speak this evening. Thank you. Um, sir, uh, sir, I'm sorry, for purpose of the record, could you please state your full name and address? I'm sorry, sorry I kind of missed that point. My name is Rich Nices. I lived in the area there at 505 Primrose for 43 years. So, I mean, I've been there a long time, and I've seen a lot of things go sideways on Kane Street. This would be one that would definitely push it sideways. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name's uh, Kyle Christina. I live at 565 Primrose. Um, so I oppose as well. I'm with everybody else as far as uh, pretty much all the discussions. Everybody's kind of made all the same points I was going to make, which is one of them was just that since the whole entire community as far west as Wallard is all um, R1, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to put an R3 right in the middle or of this area. And I just want to say with the comprehensive plan, it kind of looks like that's kind of where you guys want to stay because it's all within a few miles. So um, anyway, that's, that's where I stand on it as well. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Kelher. I live at 585 Primrose Court. My property joins Joe's property. And we've lived there for 20 years, me and my wife. I mean, it took us 20 years to put together what we put together where we live. It's a nice, quiet, private area. Secluded, no issues with anything else. So the rezoning issue is what I have a problem with from the R1 to the R3. So in all consideration to us and the rest of the neighbors, we'd like to turn it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? Okay, do we have any virtual comments? We do not have any written comments, and I've unmuted our phone participants as well. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, the city clerk has not received any emails regarding this public hearing. Okay, thank you. Bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Yes, Mr. Mrs. Frank. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So yes, I did get a chance to talk to some neighbors that live right around there, and I can understand why. I took the time and drove up there and walked around there, and this, this piece of property shouldn't have a three-story behemoth of something there. A little ranch house would be great, or maybe a side-by-side -side duplex at the most, but yeah, I, I'm not in favor of this idea of putting a three-story beast of a building there, so. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Rousseau. Uh, I agree with the commission that, that this uh, zoning change is not appropriate. I do not support an R3 right in the middle of a, an R1 district. So thank you. Okay, thank Mr. You. Mayor. Yes. So I want to extend a thank you to everybody that came in this evening to uh, share their thoughts uh, about this change from R1 to R3. And I definitely support their request for us to deny it. Um, and I also want to support the commission in their vote. Okay. Any others? Okay. The motion is to uh, receive and file and concur with the denial. Adrian, would you make, uh, call the roll, please? Excuse Barber? Me. Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Public hearing number three is public hearing for the water service connection charge assessment, 1951 West 32nd Street. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. And file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Resnick. Motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. Water Department Manager Chris Lester requests the City Council establish the final schedule of assessments 
at $6,989.36 for the water service connection charge for 1951 West 32nd Street. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, we are in a, a public hearing uh, for water service connection charge assessments uh, to 1951 32nd Street. Is there anyone in the chambers to address us on this? Seeing no one, do we have any virtual comments? We do not have any written comments. Okay. And the city clerk has not received any emails on this item. Okay, thank you very much. I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Okay, is there uh, anyone with any public input in the Council Chambers? Okay, do we have any virtual input? We have Molly Grover from the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and city manager Mike Van Milligan. I'm here tonight first to thank the city for the partnership and working with the chamber to address and resolve concerns regarding the escrow and abatement of rent ordinance that you will be considering tonight. The business community recognizes the importance of addressing problem properties that create safety hazards for residents and result in blighted neighborhoods in our community. Our community's local financial institutions also see the need to address these properties, but there were some significant issues in the first draft of the ordinance that would have negatively impacted our local institutions. Specifically, there were concerns around the apportionment of rents that are assigned to banks as collateral and process protections that ensured this ordinance is only applied in the most egregious of cases with robust notification standards. After the chamber facilitated multiple conversations between city staff and those local financial institutions, concerns were addressed and changes were made that deliver solutions that work for all parties. We sincerely thank the city for the opportunity for the business community to provide feedback, input, and collaboration. And I forgot to announce my address, Molly Grover, with the Zubik Area Chamber of Commerce, 300 Main Street, Suite 200. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, virtual? There are no other comments. No. Okay. And the city clerk has not received any public input. Okay. We'll move on then, Adrian, to the action items. Action item number one is Dubuque County Land and Water Legacy Conservation Bond Referendum presentation. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Roussel, please. I move to receive and file and listen to the presentation. Second by Farber. Motion by Ms. Roussel, second by Ms. Farber. Whenever you're ready, Brian. <laughs>
Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor and City Council members for the opportunity to be here tonight to uh, discuss in, uh, the Dubuque County Land and Water uh, Legacy uh, Bond Initiative. Um, back in 2007, um, I became the director of the Dubuque County Conservation Department. And uh, one of my first goals was to create a long range plan. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, we had the events of 2008. Uh, we had two floods and a tornado that came through our parks. Um, kind of derailed that for a while. We started to get kind of back up on our feet and then 2010 we were hit by another flood. 2011, a really epic flood. Uh, so finally, uh, we got caught up for all our flood repair and, and reacting from all those events and, and we were able to sit down and, and uh, start developing a long range uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, it was two year planning project started back in 2018. Uh, we had a 13 member steering committee and we had 11 public input meetings. Uh, 30 plus individuals were interviewed and, uh, for their community leaders for their input and uh, we reached over 5,300 people via social media. Uh, we received a lot of written comments, 302 written comments and we had uh, five newspaper articles um, and the conservation board uh, adopted and uh, our our comprehensive plan in the fall of 2020. There we go. So uh, our top 10 projects identified over the next five to 10 years uh, covered a wide gamut of different things. Uh, one of the projects that's in play right now and, and uh, we'll be having a, a public hearing uh, this Thursday is a stream play and restoration project at Swiss Valley Park. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been to Swiss Valley Park, a uh, really heavily used area. Uh, we have the stream crossing uh, that goes through and, and people drive through there, uh, but kids love to play in that area. Uh, I was a park ranger for many years before I became the director of the conservation department. It always made me nervous having those kids play in that area. I love to see kids out uh, appreciating, getting that uh, appreciation for our natural resources, playing in the water. Uh, that's how I grew up. I, I meant to say a little bit about myself at the very beginning, but I grew up in the north end of Dubuque. Um, it's really exciting to see everything that's going on in Dubuque. Um, I grew up in a point uh, in, in Dubuque where there was kind of a funny t-shirt that went around, the last person to leave Dubuque, please turn off the lights. Uh, but that's not the case anymore um, with the Port of Dubuque, the warehouse district and all that. So uh, very passionate about the area. I still live here. Uh, south of Dubuque, but we come in and spend a lot of time in Dubuque. And getting back to Swiss Valley Park, um, water quality, uh, stream restoration is really important. Getting the appreciation for kids uh, to actually touch the water, experience that. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, bidding that project out after our public hearing and in that project, hopefully we'll go to construction yet this fall. It, in, it includes getting a player area off the side of the creek crossing so the kids are attracted there and not to play in the stream crossing, but it does a lot of things. It pulls back those stream banks. Uh, it, um, it puts a lot of natural vegetation back along the stream. Uh, it provides fish habitat and in-stream habitat projects. So it's an exciting project that came from the long range planning uh, process. Uh, the Interstate Power Forest Preserve uh, parking lot enhancements. Uh, we're, the Dubuque County Conservation Board was approached by a group called the Tri-State Mountain Bike Riders and uh, uh, very unique. You know, we didn't allow bicycles on our trails, um, but we heard from a, a user group that really didn't have any other opportunities to go anywhere else. We partnered with them to build trails at the Interstate Power uh, Preserve. Quickly, it became uh, a mecca for mountain bikers. Uh, it kind of went viral. Uh, some, some folks were traveling through the area, discovered uh, the interstate uh, preserve and the proving grounds recreation area just north of town uh, put those uh, videos on youtube we now get visitors from all over the uh, the midwest we get uh, i was out there just one day um, and i always look at license plates and try to visit with the folks that are visiting our areas uh, we had folks from madison uh, des moines area and the omaha area all in one day um, another the next day i was out there and visited with some folks from Minneapolis that heard about it and, and traveled down here uh, to spend time at, at those two mountain bike areas. Uh, so 
that's located along Old Davenport Road, kind of a narrow road. Uh, we quickly outgrew uh, the parking uh, there. So um, that was one of the things that showed up in our long range planning process that the need for additional parking there. Some of the things that we really didn't um, expect were people were looking for more primitive experiences in the outdoors. So we have our established campgrounds like at Swiss Valley and Massey, Mud Lake, uh, you know, mostly RV type style camping. Uh, people were looking for more of a wilderness experience. They asked for remote campsites, areas they could back back into or bike into. Uh, so that lead, led to the installation of some uh, camping platforms at, along the Heritage Trail out near Twin Springs. We have three platforms installed now. Uh, they're available for reservation through mycountyparks.com uh, or on a first come first serve basis. We've already had people uh, many people reserving them and utilizing those spots, and we're getting lots of positive feedback on those. One of the things that was also mentioned in the Long Range Plan was a paving of the Heritage Trail. Um, it was a 10-foot wide surface and 2-foot soft shoulders. So about 57% of the folks uh, in our Long Range Plan, the public import, um, were in favor of hard surface in the, the Heritage Trail. Um, cabins at New Wine Park. Uh, a lot of folks don't have campers or tents or that ability to, uh, to get a camper, so they look for uh, cabins they can reserve. We really don't have any uh, camp, ca camping cabins available to the public, so uh, camping cabins were identified at New Wine Park uh, as one of those things that people would like to see. Um, and entry drive and river access improvements at Finley's Landing. Um, I forget where, how many miles, but Finley's Landing is the only accessible sandbar. I think it's within a 60 mile uh, drive from Dubuque that you can get to a sandbar without owning a boat. Mm -hmm. So you can come into the park and walk right out to the sandbar and enjoy uh, the view. Uh, it's a beautiful view out there at Finley's Landing and, and the Mississippi River. Uh, disc golf has been increasing in popularity. Um, the Proving Grounds uh, Recreation Area was donated to the Conservation Department by John Deere uh, Dubuque Works. Uh, we developed um, about 10 miles of mountain bike trails out there, but we still have a, a growing demand for disc golf, and we have proposed a wetland restoration project at that site to get groundwater back into uh, the correct hydrology being absorbed into the ground and not running off the top of the surface. Uh, one of the things that also popped up quite often was the Southwest Arterial Trail. With the completion of that project, um, I know there's a, a graded area for a trail, uh, but that was a very uh, popular item uh, in our public comments. And the Little Makoka Greenway. So those are some of the top 10 projects identified by the public uh, in the long range plan. So the Dubuque County Conservation Board was approached by a group uh, formed called the Dubuque County Land and Water Legacy. Um, they asked the Conservation Board to petition the Board of Supervisors. So in this long range planning effort, we identified over $66 million worth of projects uh, that were necessary in our, in our parks to meet the growing demand, uh, the growing interest of the public. Um, so on July 15th, 2021, the Conservation Board uh, adopted this language and petitioned the Board of Supervisors uh, to place uh, this on the ballot. Included in that petition was this breakdown uh, of how those funds would be spent. 35% uh, or $14 million on park improvements and expansion. The Conservation Board was created in 1957. And it was created by a vote of the people. There was a gentleman by the name of Thomas McBride who tried to talk the legislature into uh, creating, allowing counties to create county conservation boards. Um, that was in the early 1900s. It wasn't until 1956 that the Iowa legislature created uh, the county conservation law and allowed um, counties to have a, a, a referendum to see if they wanted to create a county conservation board. His theory that all conservation was local. Uh, conservation was best close to the, the public it was serving. 
it passed by 83% in Dubuque County in 1957. Uh, when, and then the Conservation Board was created. Most of our facilities are from that era. They were built in the 1960s or shortly thereafter and are, are in need of, of desperate improvement. Some of our pavilions are still uh, some of those original uh, structures. Uh, water quality, land protection, and habitat management, 35% or 14 million. Uh, trail improvements, development, and expansion, 20% or 8 million. And other uses such as ag-related water quality initiatives, ATV trails, kayak launches, and funding for cities for urban trails is 10% or $4 million. Some of these, um, I just want to give you a few examples of some of the projects in our long-range plan. Uh, our entire long-range plan can be found at DubuteCounty.org. I also brought a hard copy. If you guys would like to have a copy of that, I, I can leave that here tonight. Um, but the Little Maquoketa Greenway, is not a new idea. Uh, back in 1961, uh, the Conservation Board had a, uh, a long-range plan that included the Little Maquoketa Greenway. This, this corridor is known for flooding. It floods often, uh, sometimes three to four times a season. Um, a lot of the crop grounds identified in gray there are seven out of 10 years the crop is lost. So seven out of 10 years they're not able to harvest a crop off of those fields because of the flooding damage. So the idea is there is to construct wetlands uh, to pull back those stream banks. What you have is a deeply incised uh, river. So when, the, when it rains, that water comes off the landscape and it, it, it's in this narrow trench and it really builds up steam, uh, gets going a lot faster and causes a lot more destruction. If you pull back those stream banks, it dissipates that energy, reconnects that stream with its floodplain and uh, um, really uh, lessens the damage. Uh, so some of the benefits of that is, is flood prevention, stormwater management, but uh, it also provides for, uh, would provide for public outdoor recreation um, in those same areas as improving water quality. Oop. Got a little. Uh, another project identified in the Long Range Plan was the Swiss Valley Nature Center remodel. I was just out there uh, yesterday. I worked the Nature Center. Um, we had a jam-packed parking lot. Our, we are really restricted by the amount of area we have for parking. Um, all day long, there was an average of 45 or 50 cars uh, parked along the driveway. So when I first, when, when RDG started to develop this, we, you know, they had staff meetings and, and meetings with the public. and. This is one of the major things that was identified is that there's just not enough space to accommodate all the people that wanted to use the area. Uh, parking is, is a huge, huge uh, restriction there. And it would reroute the road uh, coming past the Nature Center, expand the parking lot. And our main entrance to the Swiss Valley Nature Center is right off the parking lot. So everybody driving in has to drive past the front doors where kiddos are coming in and out for uh, environmental education programs. Um, uh, one of the really exciting things that came out of this long range plan is a memorandum of understanding with the Dubuque Community School District. So now every K through uh, sixth grader is gonna have that opportunity to come out and have an environmental education. So every grade at every level will be touched by our environmental education program. Um, and it's gonna drive a lot more traffic to the Nature Center. Um, so it would improve safety, uh, accessibility, and uh, allow for a lot more people to get out and enjoy this area. This is an a architect's rendition of what it would look like. It would also uh, expand. I was a naturalist uh, when we expanded the Nature Center. I did environmental education program for several years, and uh, I'd never dreamt that we would outgrow the addition to our Nature Center, but we have. And this would allow us to build a much larger meeting space, rearrange, bring the, the restrooms down onto the first floor. They're currently on the second floor. You gotta get some exercise to get up there. Um, and have a much larger meeting room and a plaza outside, an open space uh, in the entryway so people could gather um, before they entered the building. The Swiss Valley Park Trail expansion. Uh, currently we have 
the Swiss Valley Nature Preserve and the Swiss Valley Park, which aren't connected. Uh, so one of the, the projects we would like to compete, complete would be to connect those two areas and have a 10-foot uh, wide uh, paved path between the two. We really do not have any ADA accessible trails, uh, especially at Swiss Valley Nature Preserve. When we get uh, groups coming out, there's no way that we can have an equitable experience uh, for all the kids if they have a, a mobility issue. It's a huge concern uh, for me, and I think, uh, you know, a really something that we need to address. Whitewater Canyon improvements. I was lucky enough to, uh, to work on this land acquisition when this became uh, available. But the Whitewater Canyon was listed as one of the 10 hidden treasures in Iowa. Uh, so uh, we had a letter from the Iowa DNR director at the time that said if this property ever uh, came up for sale, that every effort should be made to protect it. Interestingly enough, um, it was one of the three proposed state parks, uh, original state parks. There's Backbone State Park, Maquoketa Cave State Park, and could have been Whitewater Canyon State Park. Um, the Conservation Board had another shot at it back in the uh, 1960s, but there was a, a Office of County Conservation Affairs, and it was thought that it was too rugged of an area to make it into a park. Uh, luckily enough, we were able to acquire it in 2006, late in 2006, uh, and open it up to the public and, and for them to enjoy. And uh, I got to work with the, the Waller family on that acquisition, and I, I'll never forget what, what Cliffy, uh, he was an excavator. Um, When he contacted us about this property, he said, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, uh, ruining property, and I want to do the right thing and protect this. Uh, and it was a, just a huge moment that they were so lucky as their family to be able to go out there and enjoy this. He wanted to share that with the, the public. So if you haven't been out to Whitewater Canyon, I encourage you to get out there. The views are breathtaking. And it is one of uh, only three true canyons in the, in the state of Iowa. So. You know, some of our plans out there is to provide some amenities. Right now, there are no bathrooms. Um, there's no water. There's no picnic shelters. Uh, we take uh, school groups out there uh, to do environmental education, and there's really no backup plan for adverse weather. But uh, <laughs> uh, we would like to add a, ca a kayak launch uh, along Whitewater Creek, uh, add some interpretive uh, panels along the trails, and uh, do some restoration work in some of those areas. I know. Um, some of those areas used to be savanna. We have the great big open grown bur oak trees with the low hanging branches and now the forests are growing up around those. A lot of our birds of conser greatest conservation need need those savanna type uh, of settings and, and we'd like to restore some of those. And some of the, uh, the other, the 10% would go towards agriculture related water quality initiatives, the Dubuque County watershed projects. Uh, they could include structural projects um, that, that would, could qualify uh, grade stabilization structures, ponds, sediment basins, grass waterways, stream bank stabilization. You know, uh, so many of our areas are impacted by, by flooding and the uh, precipitation has become much harder and, and uh, much more frequent. So a lot of these practices are really uh, needed on those upland sites to, uh, to control that runoff and improve water quality and habitat for uh, not only our fish, but our, our mussel species that are, are in our streams. Um, we just did a mussel survey down at uh, uh, Lido Creek uh, along Bowstring Wildlife Area that we just uh, acquired a couple years ago. And we found uh, a, an endangered mussel down there, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we have some folks coming in to see if they can uh, find some more of those. But a really exciting find. We're, we're really excited about that. But uh, one other, I'm kind of a wildlife nerd. Uh, I didn't include it in the pictures, but for the first time in the last 100 years, we had a successful sandhill crane nest uh, at the John Deere Marsh uh, area, uh, just north of Dubuque, near the, the, the John Deere Dubuque work. So that's pretty exciting. That really got me really pumped up. But uh, it's been over 100 years since we've had a successful nest. We're really excited about that. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd yes. be more than happy to entertain. Yeah, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions? Mr. Cavanaugh? Yeah. Thank you very much for being here, Brian. That was, that was a great presentation. There's a lot of great projects you have in mind. Um, one, maybe two questions for you real quick. I didn't hear you say anything about um, 
the, the possibilities that passing this might bring in terms of you know, being able to actually secure more funding down the line. Is it accurate that if this passes, that it puts Dubuque County in a position to be able to access um, you know, matched grants and things like that? Is, that? is that part of this as well? That is absolutely the expectation. So it is expected, and I, and I use Polk County as an example. Um, they passed a, uh, a referendum several years ago uh, for $50 million, and they were able to bring in, I think, close to $45 million of additional um, grants, donations, and other things to, to make that work. We would expect um, to, a, to bring in um, at least that much uh, to help offset the cost of these projects. You know, this would be a portion of the funding. It would not be the, the final uh, uh, funding source or the only funding source for many of these projects. We would be soliciting uh, other partners, donations, grants, um, and it would help us leverage uh, many more dollars for, for these projects. And I think uh, the Parks to People program is a really good example of that. The City of Dubuque was involved, the Dubuque County Conservation Board, along with Jones and, and Jackson Counties, and Marie Ware was really uh, key in that. But through that Parks to People program, they were able to leverage uh, four to five times uh, the, the amount allocated towards those projects. So the, those dollars that were allocated were leveraged four to five times uh, on projects in the area. So yeah. we would expect um, and we'd go after additional grants and donations to leverage yeah. those dollars. I mean, that's, that's a huge deal when you think about it. I mean, when you can multiply things in that way. Only uh, other quick question for you. You know, the last slide I'm looking at here is still on our screen is the one about watershed projects. I mean, you know, we've got the, the B branch, we've got the Catfish Creek watershed here in, within their city limits. Are, those, are these gonna be funds that, you know, as a city government, we're going to be able to, to access to be able to, to do something with the projects that we propose going forward? Yeah, I, I certainly expect that that will be the case. So, um, yep. Uh, communities will be able to, to apply for those funds and, mm -hmm. and uh, work through programs specifically uh, with uh, the Dubuque County Watershed, or what's the name of it? Uh, Did, with sure. Eric Schmeckel. Yeah. Okay. Group. Yep. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Preston, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think getting information out there is very important, and I appreciate uh, your enthusiasm for these great projects. Uh, as I mentioned to you before the meeting, I gave you a copy of the uh, letter of a former um, county supervisor who had some questions, and I thought you might want to just address those head on. And But I just... Instead of talking about what he talked about, I'll just ask you a, a couple things. Now, so you have um, $40 million. Have those, has that $40 million, those projects been identified as um, we're doing these projects or just, because I noticed that you have broad guidelines, 35% here, 35% there. Yep. But you mentioned the top 10, are those top 10 for sure? And then there may be more or how? So, How does that work? So all the projects will have to be go through the vetting process. So, you know, before any project starts, it will have to be, um, we'll hold public input sessions. We'll get, um, have public hearings before any public improvement project can, can commence. So uh, there are a lot of, there will be a lot of ways for people to get input uh, prior to those projects commencing. So when, if this uh, would pass, um, the way it would work is that we would create a list of proposed projects, take it the conservation board, take that to the board of supervisors, and they would have to approve that and allocate or, or approve uh, that bond letting uh, for those projects. So there would be a lot of eyes on these projects and a lot of opportunities for public input, um, putting those proposed lists of projects together and, and bringing them forward, and then before they get started, getting public input and, and public hearing. So. Um, Right. And that you just I, sec, uh, answered my second question was I didn't know how that works. So the conservation board recommends the county supervisors approve. Correct. Great. And thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank Mayor. you very much, Brian, for that. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry. If I could, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that Art Roach, who did submit the request to present this evening, he's the chair of the Dubuque County Soil, Land, and Water Conservation Legacy is on the phone. Okay. Go ahead, Art. 
Hi, I'm a, well, thank you very much. Art Roach, and uh, I, am, I am the chair of the, of the uh, Dubuque County Land and Water Legacy. I live at 5451 Meadow Court in Asbury, and I really don't have any further comments. I think Brian presented the case very well. Um, I, I really applaud the work that's been done over the years by the uh, Dubuque County Conservation Board. And, and also by the Board of Supervisors and, and really diligently looking at this issue before they made the decision to put it on the on the ballot on November 2nd. So I'm looking forward to uh, uh, a big, overwhelming uh, vote from the county voters for this conservation bond issue. That's really all I want to say. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Art. Okay, and thank you again, Brian, for that, uh, that presentation. Okay, the motion uh, is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number two is proposed ordinance amendment to incorporate rent abatement and escrow accounts. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. The building codes adopted by the city council combined with the rental license ordinance dictates the fines, fees, and penalties for non-compliance with building codes as well as the rental licensing ordinance. The state of Iowa code allows cities several ways to encourage property owners to keep properties maintained and licensed when letting that property to another person or renting the property. The city of Dubuque ordinance does not currently provide for all remedies that the state of Iowa allows. The remedies not listed in the city ordinances are rent abatement and the establishment of an escrow account. With the proposed ordinance amendment, the city will be able to abate rent if a property owner fails to carry an active rental license, has failed to provide an essential utility service, or failed to remedy a condition that poses a substantial risk to the health or safety of the tenant. Rent abatement means that the property owner is unable to recover any rent from a tenant until the situation is cured. The rent that is abated never becomes due and payable. If the city abates rent, notification will be provided to both the property owner agent and the tenants affected. Additionally, with a proposed ordinance change, the city may set up an escrow account for a property that remains in non-compliance with city codes. Rent normally paid to the property owner is instead paid to the city and placed in this escrow account. The escrow account is used to abate the violations and bring the property up to code. Any money remaining in the escrow account after violations are remedied is returned to the property owner. In most situations, the escrow will reimburse the cost of the improvements so tenants do not have to wait for improvements to be made. These remedies for violations allowed by the state of Iowa will be helpful in gaining compliance for property owners that continue to ignore notice of violations, municipal infractions, and court orders and allows the city to help tenants live in a safe space by fixing the violations. City staff met with the Dubuque Area Landlord Association Executive Board in June, July, and October of 2021. Suggestions for edits to the ordinance from the June meeting were made and discussed again at the July 2021 meeting. City staff met with a group of local banks in August 2021 regarding the proposed ordinance to ensure there was collaboration and notification to banks that have lien mortgages backed by the property, the asset, and rent generated or income. Based on the input, changes were made to timeliness for notifications and appeal periods, as well as the ability for the first lien holder, holder to appeal the escrow determination. And you heard, uh, the president and CEO of the Buke Area Chamber of Commerce, Molly Grover, speak earlier in the evening about this uh, very process, which uh, the um, Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce had uh, initially brokered the meetings with the banks. These additional options for remedies do not preclude the city from using other remedies, such as issuing additional municipal infractions, declaring a public nuisance, charging the property owner with contempt of court, 
or petitioning for the title to a property. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger recommends the City Council adopt an ordinance to allow for all remedies allowed by the State of Iowa for correcting code violations in rental properties. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Do you have any questions? Ms. Farber? Um, Mike, there was an email that I had seen uh, later on this afternoon regarding manufactured homes and the rentals there. Mm -hmm. Is there an interpretation that could potentially relate to those property owners, tenants? Well, I'm going to let Alexis Steger, the Housing and Community Development Department Director, respond to that question. Thank you. Alexis Steger, Housing and Community Development Director. Um, the, so if a manufactured home is owned by the person living in it, they would not be subject to this ordinance. This ordinance is specific to rental properties that are, fall under a rental license as required by the ordinance. Um, if the manufactured home is rented as opposed to owned, then it would fall under this as that manufactured home needs to be licensed with the city of Dubuque. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions? Mr. Kavanaugh? I have a follow-up to that exact question, actually. Okay. Um, the, one of the things that I'm interested in is the definition of failed to provide a utility service, so failed to provide an essential service. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, how broad is that definition of failed to provide a service? Um, it's not very broad. So Section 108 of the IPMC that was adopted is actually the code that um, condemns the property in such a state. Um, it is a required utility that is not served. So it's water. Um, I apologize. The three essential utilities, I'm, it's like electric, water, gas, if served to the home. Um, so that is what the definition is of Section 108, which is specific to this ordinance. We use that same language. Okay. Got it. I think um, the, so the question that Ms. Farber asked, though, the, the one about um, manufactured homes and the, the lots that are there that are, are rented in most cases, um, the water service to those, is that considered something, I mean, that's provided by the, for instance, the owner of the manufactured home park. So that water service, one of the complaints that um, I think we've heard from people in the manufactured homes here in Dubuque is that they're, um, for instance, being overcharged for water service and then not being paid back in a timely fashion. Um, it's a hard thing for us as a municipality so far to be able to enforce in any way. Um, but is there something within that that is that could be useful in making sure that that folks who are in that situation are actually getting that service in the way that that service is supposed to be provided? So in our codes outside of the ordinance being proposed, um, IPMC applies to all property and structures on that property. Mm -hmm. In the property maintenance code, it would require that the meter is functioning, that um, certain things like that are existing and functioning. Um, it does not require that that meter is tested for how many gallons are going through it, just that the water is able to flow to the property. Um, so as far as overbilling, no, our ordinances don't cover that. But as far as the, the structure functionally working to get water to the home, yes, we already have ordinances that cover that. It just would not fall under a rent abatement or a rent escrow. And I'm not clear on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you can you explain sure. that a little bit? Why would it, if it's not functioning, then why wouldn't it fall under this renovation or rent escrow? We have other remedies under the IPMC that are outside of the ordinance you're considering today. Those remedies would be used for something that didn't require a rental license. If you're only renting the lot, you do not require a rental license in the city of Dubuque. So the IPMC, we could, we could abate. We can issue a municipal infraction so that the court orders them to fix the water. Um, we can condemn the property to uh, Section 108, which then allows us to abate that issue, I mean fix it, mm -hmm. and then charge the property uh, as a lien. Mm -hmm. So we have other remedies for that type of situation outside of something that would be required for a rental license. Yes. Okay. Okay. I understand now. Um, either way, I, I think this is a, a great move in the right direction, and I appreciate you finding more ways that we can make sure that we can enforce and, and make sure that people have uh, safe places to live. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Samir. Yes, Mr. Reddy. Yeah, thank you. First of all, before my question, I do want to express my appreciation for the comments by uh, uh, Ms. Grover because, uh, you know, talks about collaboration and uh, cooperation with city staff and, and, and so many other partners with this, so I appreciate that. My question to you is, I know you mentioned the utilities, but in many places, they start, uh, they, they've asked people to consider 
access to the internet and broadband as almost a utility. And that uh, today, in today's world, what is that a possibility that uh, we're moving towards as far as equity, et cetera, that you know, everybody has access to uh, the internet? Uh, ha is there any move to make that uh, kind of as, as important as water and sewer and electricity? The access to internet, is that, have you heard anything about that possibility? As far as building codes that you see us fall under for when you adopt like IPMC, no, we haven't seen that, the code um, heading that direction as um, a essential utility for broadband. We have seen some movement in our federal regulations from CDBG that is calling a broadband a utility and therefore is fundable through some of those federal sources. So we've seen change on, uh, on kind of a different home front, but not as um, being considered for an essential service. I see. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Alexis. Okay, the motion uh, is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. Motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Fuel? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number three is Lead and Healthy Home Program Grant Agreement. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Kavanaugh. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Resnick. Motion by Mr. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger recommends City Council authorization of an agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, for the use of $4,275,680.92 to administer the Lead and Healthy Homes Program. The City of Dubuque has been administering a Lead and Healthy Homes Program for over 20 years. This program assists residents in making their homes lead safe through remediation of the lead hazards in the home. The City of Dubuque submitted a Lead and Healthy Homes grant application in July 2021 to request this amount to continue this program for an additional 42 months. The Housing and Community Development Department will administer this program, partnering with the Visiting Nurses Association to help evaluate the health needs in the home. The city will also team with the Four Mounds Heart Program to complete the construction and lead remediation in some of the units. This program requires a program manager that dedicates at least 75% of a full-time equivalent position to this grant. Due to the two Lead and Healthy Homes grants overlapping for 11 months, an additional temporary full-time equivalent will be required to administer this grant Therefore, increasing the number of full-time equivalents in the housing department on a temporary basis by one. This agreement is for 42 months and will complete approximately 106 units. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Have any discussion? Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Harper. I'm oh. sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think so. my hand. I, I'm wondering if I can ask a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a it, it it's related to this, but I'm just curious because I, I want to know. You sent an email earlier today. I, again, this is going to be for you, Alexis, if that's all right. Um, you sent an email earlier today. Said there's a little over what was it, nineteen thousand or yeah, nineteen thousand homes that were built pre nineteen seventy eight potentially have lead paint in them. My my question is just are we are we doing is there anything else we can be going for? Is there, are we doing as much as really is we realistically can in this regard, or is there something else that maybe we should be looking at to, to try and remediate even more than what we're doing now? It's just a curiosity question. Sure, so we have quite a few programs other than the Lead and Healthy Homes that um, try to help with the situation. Um, we have part of the CLIP program from the state. If we do have elevated blood levels for kiddos, the kiddos have to be tested by a certain amount of time in their age um, to make sure that if they are getting lead ingested that we can remediate that issue and we do respond to those. Um, there's casework on the VNA side, but we respond to evaluate the home. 
Um, where is the lead coming from? And if it's not the home, the daycare, wherever that happens to be. Um, we are also building in checks for all rentals. Um, when we go in for a rental inspection, if we see peeling paint in a home that was built before 1978, we do mark that as a potential lead hazard that has to be corrected in, in a specific amount of time. Um, if there's kiddos in the home, we refer them actually to make sure that there aren't any additional issues. So although the funding may not support getting into 19,000 units and we've gotten into 1,400 about to date, um, we're doing other things in those other units to try to prevent the lead poisoning of more, more children. Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead, Mike. Thank you. If I might add, and while I don't have the statistics handy, and I apologize for that, um, we have seen a dramatic decrease in lead poisoned children over that 20 year period. So we know we're, we are having a positive impact. Good point. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, the motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7 0. Action item number four is Dubuque Fire Department accreditation by the Commission on Fire Accreditation International of the Center for Public Safety Excellence. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? Yes, I move to receive and file. Second. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Mr. Jones. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Fire Chief Rick Steinus is advised that on Wednesday, October 13th, 2021, the Center for Public Safety Excellence Commission on Fire Accreditation International voted to designate the Dubuque Fire Department as an accredited agency. Dubuque becomes one of less than 300 accredited agencies worldwide. Fire Chief Rick Steinus describes accreditation as, and I quote, it's not what you get, it's what you become. You don't get accredited, you become accredited. And as an accredited agency, you build a culture of improvement, close quotes. This is the culmination of over five years of work in preparation for this day. I want to especially recognize the work of Fire Chief Rick Steinus, Lead Accreditation Manager Assistant Chief Kevin Esser, and former Accreditation Manager and current Assistant Accreditation Manager Assistant Chief Josh Nepper. We are very proud of our fire department and the people who work in the department protecting property and lives every day. This was never more apparent and appreciated than during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is no working from home for our brave firefighters and medical officers. As people were isolating, social distancing, and masking up, these were the people who were there when tragedy struck. At the same time, many of them were dealing with the traumas of this pandemic in their personal lives. We owe all of them a deep debt of gratitude that they chose public service as a career and that they do their work so well and with such compassion. The Dubuque Fire Department has an Insurance Service Organization, or ISO rating, as a Class II, placing the department in the top 3% in the country. Since 2017, the Dubuque Fire Department has been awarded an annual re since 2017, the Dubuque Fire Department has been an annual recipient of the American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline Award for Excellence in Emergency Care, and in 2021 also received the award for excellence in the treatment of heart attacks. Each year, over 300 business chief executive officers in the Dubuque area are interviewed by the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation on satisfaction with city services and the fire department consistently receives an average score of over six on a scale of one to seven, receiving a 90% satisfaction rating in the most recent survey, with the fire department in general being the highest rated city service and the ambulance service being the second highest rated city service. We know we are not perfect and we commit to improving in the areas identified by the assessment team. The Commission on Fire Accreditation International advises that accreditation is a process of agency self-assessment. 
The Dubuque Fire Department spent over five years working towards achieving accreditation. The Commission on Fire Accreditation International says this achieves the following. Provides greater community alignment, encourages quality improvement, facilitates input from and builds positive relationships with labor, identifies areas of strengths and weaknesses, allows for the establishment of a plan for improvement, provides data-supported decision-making, communicates management and leadership philosophies, ensures your agency has a defined mission and related objectives, encourages the development of organizational procedural documents. Accredited agencies are often described as being community-focused, data-driven, outcome-focused, strategic-minded, well-organized, properly equipped, and properly staffed and trained. Part of the reason for this is the holistic scope of the Commission on Fire Accreditation International Model. It includes 11 categories that cover the span of fire and emergency service operations. Number one is governance and administration. Number two is assessment and planning. Number three is goals and objectives. Number four is financial resources. Number five is community risk reduction programs. Number six is physical resources. Number seven is human resources. Number eight is training and competency. Number nine, essential resources. Number 10, external systems relationship. And number 11, health and safety. Agency accreditation is a voluntary process. Accreditation is an international recognition of achievement. It shows to the community that the fire department continually self-assesses, looks for opportunities for improvement, and is transparent and accountable through third-party verification and validation. The Commission on Fire Accreditation International has 11 members on their board that represent a cross-section of the fire and emergency service, including fire departments, city and county management, labor, standards development organizations, and the U.S. Department of Defense. The current commissioners on the board are Steve Dongworth, the Fire Chief of Calgary, Alberta, Canada Fire Department, Steve Dirksen, the Fire Chief of Fargo, North Dakota Fire Department, Bradley Arnold, the County Administrator, Sumter County, Florida Board of County Commissioners, Thomas Breyer, the Director of Fire and EMS Operations for the International Association of Firefighters, John Butler, Fire Chief, Fairfax County, Virginia Fire and Rescue Department, Ken Holland, the Senior Emergency Service Specialist for the National Fire Protection Association, Salvatore Izzo, the Senior Risk Control Fire Protection Engineer for the Insurance Services Organization, James Keating, the Fire Chief, Red, White, and Blue Fire Protection District of Breckenridge, Colorado. Jess, Jesse Lytle, the Administrator for Washington Township, Ohio. Greg Moraguchi, the Fire Chief for the Navy Region Hawaii Fire and Emergency Services. And Jake Rhodes, the Fire Chief of Kingman, Arizona Fire Department. We also know that even with all these positive recognitions, additional investments have been directed by the Mayor and City Council. In fiscal year 2019, the fire department was authorized for 89 uniformed personnel. Beginning in fiscal year 2020, the fire department initiated a plan to add staff as part of the plan to add a West End fire station. This plan outlines adding one additional firefighter each year from fiscal year 2020 through fiscal year 2025, bringing the total personnel count to 95. One staff member was added in fiscal year 2020 and in fiscal year 2021. Due to the budget issues caused by the pandemic, no staff were added in fiscal year 2022, but two are expected to be added in fiscal year 2023, so that's next year's budget process then one in fiscal year 2024, and one in fiscal year 2025. The city also froze some vacant positions during the economic crisis created by the pandemic, putting extra strain on employees' schedules, allowing fewer vacation opportunities, 
and required more overtime of existing staff. Now that those vacancies have become unfrozen, the city is moving quickly to fill those open positions. The fire department staff ex expansion plan also calls for the addition of up to six more firefighters in fiscal year 2026 to increase the authorized uniform personnel total to 101, depending on whether a seventh fire station is added or an existing fire station is relocated. The Dubuque Fire Department has created a mission statement stated as follows. To protect, assist, and educate our community and visitors with pride, skill, and compassion. Our shared values are integrity. We serve in an honest and equitable fashion. We respect those we serve and are accountable to them. Professional. We provide a high degree of excellence. We work with a positive attitude. Dedication. We are committed to helping our neighbors. We strive to do our best for others. Skill, our ability is important in the lives of our neighbors. We hold ourselves to a high standard. Compassion, we show empathy for those in need and seek ways to be helpful. We perform with a sense of community. Pride, our tradition is a job well done. We strive to be prompt, safe, and fit for duty. My thanks to the Mayor and City Council for your support throughout this process and my congratulations to the members of the Dubuque Fire Department. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Chief Steinis, I, uh, I'm very, very proud of uh, you and your staff for uh, becoming an accredited uh, fire department. Uh, you know, I, I think everything uh, Mike spoke about uh, really speaks to the depth of uh, commitment of your staff and their uh, pursuit of excellence and you know, you're to be commended as well as uh, all of your leadership staff and all the firefighters and paramedics that serve under you. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I can speak on behalf of the council and I say we are extremely proud uh, to have you and, and your staff as part of our community and thank you for all that you do. If I could have a, a word, uh, Rick Steinis, Fire Chief. So, um, City Manager, um, gave a very thorough um, explanation of the process. Uh, I can tell you from the, a personal perspective, uh, I've been watching the uh, accreditation you know, kind of wave build in the, in the country for the last 20 years or so, and it was something that I thought was a really worthwhile effort. Uh, in early 2014, Fire Chief Dan Brown asked me if I wanted to uh, attend an accreditation course, and. Uh, I jumped on it. I was like, yes, finally, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, myself as an assistant chief, uh, assistant chief Cal Mach, who was our training officer at the time, and then Lieutenant Josh Knapper, uh, the three of us spent a few days in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, learning kind of the preliminary stuff about accreditation. And um, we learned that, oh my gosh, this is a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of things. Um, one of the things that it forces you to do is really look internally and not just um, feel that you do a good job, but to be able to prove it. And I think that's what, what the, uh, the effort really was about. We came back and we started uh, building a team. Um, there were a lot of days where you know, we didn't make progress and there were days where we had good progress. And um, then we threw the whole works in the garbage and started over sometimes <laughs> um, because we were really learning as we went. So it was a long um, kind of arduous process frustrating at times and exhilarating at times and um, it really included everybody so you know on behalf of the women and men of the, the Dubuque Fire Department I have to thank the council and the city manager for their support and that effort because uh, everybody on the department worked to some extent uh, you know when we were when we were doing things we didn't think were about accreditation they were about accreditation whether it was uh, recruitment efforts and how we built programs or uh, simple things like um, turnout times. When we ask people, hey, we're going to start watching your turnout times. We're going to start um, calling you up when it took you too long to get out of the building. And uh, we do that. And now people just know that, yeah, that was a long one. I'm going to get a call. It's coming. And I have to justify why I didn't get out in time. 
And, you know, those things happen. So we build a, a system around that. And so it touched everybody. And uh, like the city manager mentioned, there were so many different categories uh, with so many different items in it. Everything from, uh, you know, support from human resources and finance department. Um, we were able to write off, check off a whole batch of them because uh, the finance department does such a good job and uh, gets that award every year for budgeting. Um, the accreditation people say, if you get that award, uh, these six boxes, just skip those, you know, whatever it was. So it was kind of nice to, to have that support from the city. Um, Public Works, who does our vehicle maintenance and water department, uh, who helps us, of course, with water system and lots of different departments that all helped us along the way. Uh, and we learned a lot about the fire department and we probably learned more things than um, we thought we were supposed to know. Um, so there was a lot, a lot to it. And, and uh, I also look at it as, uh, you know, we, we try to always look at it as not being a project. It's not over, it's not something that you do, you get a plaque and, and you're finished. Uh, so it's a milestone. It's really just the next step. Um, we spent some time, in fact, last week already talking about uh, how to improve that ISO classification and how are we going to get a better number in class two and how are we going to eventually get to class one and some stuff like that. So um, it just continues all the time. And that's that, that's that culture that's being built uh, by all the members in the department to keep looking at how we do things and are we doing it the correct way? Is there a better way for us to do it? And how can we serve the citizens better? So thank you for the recognition. Thank you. Anyone else want to make any comments? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones? I, I'd just add that this uh, huge accomplishment occurred in the midst of COVID and increased call volume and increased call acuity and increased uh, time to prepare for calls and to um, reassess after calls and, and get back in a, in a ready status. Um, so it's it's a pretty amazing thing that that happened when it happened and how it happened. I, I, I've never I can't remember ever being prouder of uh, of our involvement in, in emergency services in the city of Dubuque. This is this is awesome, and to our law enforcement friends uh, and and fans, uh, that agency's been accredited for decades, and it shows on the streets, and this is going to show in the in the firehouses. It's going to be a godsend as we go forward figuring out this. Um, seventh station, where should it be, how should it be, because we, we know so much more about ourselves and our operation than we did even five years ago. So congratulations, Rick. Well done, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Okay, Mr. Cabin. Yeah, thank you, and congratulations. Um, so I, I already heard you say this, but it, one thing I know about accreditation is that, yes, it's something to be celebrated, absolutely, um, but it does force you into this position of, what's next. You're always thinking about what's what's on you know the list that you need to start to improve and think about and all those kinds of things. And I heard you mention a few things. Um, I heard you mention staff levels and Mike pointed that out in his um, in, in his uh, memo as well. So what are some of the things you know when we head into next year thinking about the budget process, the resources that you're going to need in your department, what are some of the things that are on your radar that we might want to know about that you're thinking about because of this accreditation process, looking ahead, saying these are some things we need to improve, we'd like to get better marks here. What are some of those? Well, um, when we did the site assessment in that report, um, that team that came in you know, and, and looked at us for four days um, left us with some recommendations. Some of them were you know, fairly small things that we were able to actually accomplish two or three of them already. Um, some of them are uh, much more difficult. Um, one of them is uh, our response time and service that we can provide to the west end of the city where things are growing essentially away from where our fire stations are and where we've traditionally you know provided service um, <coughs> so that's one of the things definitely on the radar um, that's why you know things like trying to do the staffing you may remember a couple years ago we did a uh, pilot uh, on a third ambulance uh, that we put on the west end and uh, you know, the pilot was only 40 days, but we learned from that that it made a difference. And we went back and now uh, every day that we were able to, staffing wise, we staff that ambulance on the West End. And we see a difference every day that it's there. Every day it's not there, we see that difference as well. Um, so we're starting to see things again, you know, accreditation. Um, we're able to talk in terms of unit hour utilizations of companies and things like that, um, where we never really had a lot of that data before. Um, so we're looking to improve our data um, so that we can make really good decisions along those lines. 
um, trying to provide that service equitably across the city. Uh, we know that, you know, we know where there are busy places, we know where there are slow places as far as call volume, um, and we need to address that, but accreditation is much, much more than uh, just the, the response times and, and things like that. Um, it's also about our community risk reduction. So, um, you know, if, we, if you'd asked us five years ago, we said, yeah, we have a pub ed thing and, you know, we do a few things. And now we have a community risk reduction program. And it incorporates so many different components and things that we're doing. And it ties into the uh, equity plan uh, that we have. Uh, that ties into, the, obviously, the city's equity plan. So um, there are pieces of that as well that, we, that we're trying to do. Right now, um, the top of mind item that's uh, probably the biggest uh, nut to crack is uh, providing that service to areas where we start to see growth. Uh, we saw a 14% increase in calls, I think it was, uh, last year during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily related to the pandemic so much, but we just saw a lot of calls. And uh, so that's taking a toll on you know, how we can keep companies in service, provide that reliable service. Uh, you drive by a fire station and you don't see anything in there, it's because they're busy, they're running calls. Uh, uh, so seven years ago when I was an assistant chief, our average calls were 11 a day. We thought we were busy. Um, now we do 24 and we just go, well, there's a 24 day. Um, sometimes it's a 35 call day. Uh, once in a while on a weekend, it'll slow down to 14 or 15. And we think, you know, so we're just seeing that change in the service uh, that's requested from the, from the public and trying to adapt to that. <clears throat> and so that's a challenge every day. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. You know, I think because one of the things that I think should be on our mind up here is just, you know, what, what are the resources you need to be able to make that happen? I mean, a 24 call day I and mean, we're talking about pretty hard to do if, you know, what, if it's difficult to fill positions or if we're freezing positions and things like that. I mean, that's something that, that is always on my mind, I know. But I appreciate that. I, you know, having been through a few accreditation processes myself, I, I know that you, you know, it's great to celebrate, but then, and we should, absolutely. But you're always thinking ahead then because all of a sudden you realize the things that, you know, the gaps that are there. And we wanna make sure that, you know, it's not just a, a documentation accreditation, mm -hmm. right? We don't just want it on paper. Um, we don't just want our, our ducks in a row as far as documentation. We want it to actually mean something mm -hmm. on the street. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Anyone else? Any comments? Hey, congratulations again uh, on becoming an accredited fire department. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you again, again, Chief. Okay, uh, the motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. That motion carries 7-0. Action item number five is Dubuque Fire Department public information brochure. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file. Second by Sprank. Motion With by. awe and appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> did you get that with awe and appreciation? Receive and file? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike, did you have anything? Uh, yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mike Van Milligan, city manager. So this um, brochure that you're looking at now, uh, recognizing the quality and achievements of our fire department, will go out with our utility bills. Uh, I think it's with the December billing cycle. And uh, well, most people get their utility bills electronically, so they'll get an electronic version of this. I think there's about 3,500 that um, don't and so they'll get theirs uh, in, in a paper copy mailed to their home. So, uh, so every home and business in town will get a copy of this. Thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, the motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. The motion carries 7-0. Action item number six is Sustainable Dubuque Community Grant Award Recommendation. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Farber. Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Sustainable Community Coordinator Gina Bell is recommending City Council approval 
of the Resilient Community Advisory Commission recommendations for the following projects for funding from the Sustainable Dubuque Community Grant Program at a total funding amount of $9,200. The following applications are recommended for funding. Clark University Climate Teach-In for $2,100. The Dubuque Jackson County Habitat for Humanity for Project Restore, $2,500. The Dubuque Rescue Mission for Garden Strong Start for $2,500. And the Tri-State Volunteer Immigrant Appointment Transportation Service for Guatemalan Economic Development Co-op for $2,100. Uh, one submission was not recommended for funding. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Buell? Aye. The motion carries 7 0. Next are council member reports. Any reports? Uh, Mr. Russell, and then we'll come to you. That's right. Thank you. I have two items I'd like to share. Um, the first was that I was very excited to attend the Renewable Natural Gas Facility opening ribbon cutting. I just think it is an exciting example of Dubuque's leadership in sustainability and how we excel at partnerships. It was also good for me to see all my former co-workers from Black Hills Energy <laughs> as one of the important partners there. Um, and the second thing is... Um, I'd like to thank all of my volunteers for Dubuque Trees Forever. The last two weekends, we've planted 45 trees in partnership with our city forester and our retired city forester, Steve Pregler. And um, thanks to the city manager for coming out to dig a shovel with his grandsons. And uh, lots of volunteers who gave up their Saturday to help green our community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spring. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, just wanted to say I was able to attend the Sister City Commission event. It was really uh, just a wonderful event to see all those lovely pictures of, of our sister cities from Russia, China, and Austria. Um, so a big thank you to our city clerk, Adrian, and of course the Sister City Commission for all their hard work on it. Thank you. Mr. Resnick? Yes, I wanted to talk about the, uh, on Thursday we had an RNG ribbon, uh, RNG plant ribbon cutting uh, at the landfill location. And so it was a great event. Uh, of course, you were there, Mr. Mayor, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Jones, who was uh, on the uh, on the board as well. And it was great, uh, the staff of the agency, the landfill agency has uh, worked for uh, many, many years to capture the methane and to uh, we used to just flare it off, which was an improvement, but now um, we, we are doing better than that. We're actually taking that methane, which is a terrible greenhouse gas, and turn it into uh, something very useful. And uh, the citizens are getting some, uh, are paid some money from a company that we've arranged to, uh, to do that. So that's very exciting. I love a win-win. Uh, for everyone, and it's, it sounded like a great project, and so I appreciate the uh, the mayor being there, as well as Mr. Dickinson and, and others, and Laura Roussel was also there. I don't want to forget Laura, and I think Danny was there too. So a lot, a lot of great, uh, a lot of great things happening. It was a day to celebrate, and it's really on brand for Dubuque, and uh, we just uh, again. Uh, I think Dubuque, like the fire department, is all about relentless improvement. It's, it's happening at the landfill, it's happening at the fire department, and I think all over the city. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Joan. I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, two weeks from tomorrow is the general election for city council and school board. And I um, hope everybody exercises their most basic civic duty and gets out and votes. Um, I just want to make a couple of quick comments on uh, Mr. Sprank's uh, uh, topic, the Sister City Photo Exhibit uh, event. Uh, you know, they had there was food there from the three cities uh, that uh, we are city uh, sister cities with, and uh, it was all great. I mean, it was all obviously you couldn't try everything because I didn't have that big of a stomach. But uh, <laughs> I, I know uh, when I visited uh, Dornbeeren and and uh, Han Don. 
uh, I didn't find anything that I didn't like, which I found to be unusual. I mean, everything tasted good, and it was, but it was very unique to the country. And uh, I really appreciated uh, seeing all of the photos uh, that were on display. And, you know, it brings back a lot of memories of, of uh, different trips that you take when you're on one of those sister city visits. And one of the things, though, that really struck me that I, I would not have thought about uh, during this pandemic had I not traveled to those cities is what are they experiencing in those countries? during this whole pandemic. I mean, that was something I thought about almost on a daily basis because I knew their resources and uh, you know how they, how they lived and what they ate and what they did you know, day to day. And uh, it really gives you a different perspective. So I think Sister Cities uh, is something we should really maybe try to expand on and, and really get into uh, knowing other people around the world. I think it's a tremendous experience. That's all I had to offer. Any, anyone else have any final? Okay, there being no further business on the agenda, we will stand adjourned. Thank you.